Hello everyone and welcome back to another pre-war era video. This is volume two of which, which is going to be uh, number two of, of many more. My goal in these pre-war videos is to show you one type of card from every card set ever made in the pre-war era video because as I'm learning I just want to show you what I'm learning as far as the sets go and the many players. So to so start things off I have a T204-1909 Ramley Fred Tenney. I fell in love with these pre-war cards, um, this set in particular, because of how beautiful the portrait is and the ornate gold leaf design, gold border. I think it's one of the most beautiful sets. And I'm telling you, when I first looked up the many sets, this is one that just caught my eye and I said, I have to have one. But I refused to invest into a nobody and also a poor subject. There's, these cards are super expensive and they're super rare to find a very nice example unless you're gonna pay through the roof. And it took me a while to find a decent player and a decent card. As I examined this card, when I opened it up, super thin stock which makes it understandable why so many of these cards are in poor shape. But Fred Tenney was a first baseman, played 17 years with a lifetime average of 294, ended up with 2,231 hits. He played for the Boston Bean Eaters and was considered one of the best defensive first basemen of all time. He originated the 363 double play, first ever to do it. And he was considered to have an unorthodox style of play because he played hug in the line or deep, which nowadays that's the way everyone plays. Next up, I have a 1939 play ball card of Rick Farrell. He's a Hall of Famer. Considered one of the best catchers throughout the 1930s and 40s. Eight-time All-Star, played 18 years with a lifetime average of 281. It's not one of the cards I'm going to be very prideful of because it's a 1.5. has um, paper loss on the top there and pretty rounded. But to be quite honest, I paid close to nothing for this card. So I didn't mind owning this card to be able to show you a 1939 play ball subject. And it's a Hall of Famer, so how could I complain? Next up, I have a 1919-21 uh, to 21 W514, or 514 of Bob Shockey. This is a hand-cut card. Whoever cut this card did a pretty good job because it was able to get a grade. Most of the time, hand-cut cards just get authentic grades because they're so badly cut. But this one's pretty good. Nothing on the back. But uh, Bob Shockey is considered one of the all-time greats to wear Yankee pinstripes. He played 15 years and won 195 games. He was a four-time 20-game winner. And he led the league in 1920 with 245 for an ERA. But his most famous feat is in 1923, he was chosen to be the opening day starter of the then brand new stadium, which is now the old Yankee Stadium. He pitched a complete game, three hitter, with one earned run for the win. So he's the first ever to get a win at that stadium. But he wasn't, uh, he wasn't famous for that day. Uh, Babe Ruth hit a three run shot, which later then became the house that Ruth built. That was the same game which he pitched in. Next up, this was another card I found pretty interesting. T201 Mecca Double Folders. This one is of Nat Blasway and of Fred Falkenberg. These cards are huge in their holders. It's like holding a picture frame here. I find these so unique because they're made to be like owning two cards in one where you bend this one and the legs match up and join right here and make it look like it's 
meant to be that picture of the other player. But the one thing, although I find these cards very unique, is that um, finding a specific superstar on the front as opposed to the back. Ty Cobb has a card with uh, Crawford and Cobb's on the back. So there's no way I wanted to own a card where the superstar is on the back, like Downey and Home Run Baker. Home Run Baker's on the back. Evers and Chance, Chance is on the back. And the ones that they are on the front, like Walter Johnson, Tris Speaker, Matthewson, Z Zach Wheat, Chief Bender, those are out there, but they're very expensive. And I was able to grab this one for lower than I expected. I was quite honestly very surprised I ended up with this card because a week prior for a grade five, uh, this card sold for around 400 and another grade five came up, which was this one. And I was expecting to pay somewhere around 350 hopefully, and I ended up getting this card for like 260 So I was super shocked that within a one week span, I got this card for so much less. But I got lucky. Usually the superstars go for like 500 or more, especially depending on the grade. But just to fill you in on Fred Falkenberg, he was a twice a 20 game winner, once with 23 and another time with 25. And he played 12 years with a 268 ERA. He's not a great pitcher or nothing to, you know, brag about, but you know, I talked enough about Nat Blasio in my last video, so I'm not going to bore you with that one. But the main one, I always leave my superstars for the end, is this 1921 American Caramel E121 of Rogers Hornsby. I am so excited to finally own a Rogers Hornsby's card. This is the back. I found it so difficult to find a good card of Rogers Hornsby that wasn't a 1933 Gaudi. The 1933 Gaudi said that he has two cards. One is where he's managing and the other one is where he's like fielding. But that was pretty much the tail end of his career where he's basically managing. I really was hoping to find a different one where he's in the prime of his career and I finally found this one and for a really good price. I think I got this one for way less than what it should have gone for. So I'm super excited. He's one of the best hitters ever to play the game. To fill you in, he played 23 years at second base with a lifetime average of 358. Only second to Ty Cobb um, lifetime wise. He's a seven-time batting title crown winner, two-time MVP in 1925 and 1929, ended up with 2,930 hits. He's a two-time triple crown winner, and in 1922, he ended up with 42 home runs, 152 RBIs with a 401 average, and he's the last one to ever hit over 40 home runs and uh, over 400 for an average. No one's ever did it since. He's hit three seasons with over 400, and his highest was 424. I am like so excited to quite honestly say that I own his card now. And also the American Caramel set is a pretty hard set to own like good subjects. So I feel like I hit a grand slam with that card. So there you go. I'm wrapping up this video with that superstar right there. And that'll make 10 subjects right now for my pre-war cards. Um, go check out the first video if you haven't seen it. I ended that one up with a pretty big superstar of two superstars also. And um, I'm going to continue to keep adding more and more subjects. The 19, no, the 1800s is going to be the ones that I'm going to find the hardest to add. But I'm still checking on those and checking for the prices and making sure I end up with a superstar or at least a good player. I don't want, I refuse to own players that only played for like one year or never even made it. Um, and also stay tuned because I have a super huge video coming up that I'm probably going to tape within a month or two. But I'm collecting a lot of cards for the theme of the video. And I'm super excited to make this video. It's probably going to be the biggest project I work on. And also I have two more videos which are going to be um, of returns from Beckett. And also one more of a return of the SGC cards which is of the T206s. I should probably be getting that one maybe within another week or two. 
So stay tuned. Hit the like, thumbs up, comment. Let me know what you think about the cards. And uh, subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Later.